Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Willow Oak Asset Management's panel discussion. It's value investing in a volatile environment. Uh, I am Stephen Keel. Uh, Scott Miller is sitting in my seat right now, and we're about to switch uh, after I do this introduction. I am the chairman of Enterprise Diversified, which is a parent company of Willow Oak Asset Management. Uh, I am also the portfolio for Arquitos uh, Capital. So Willow Oak, this is a Willow Oak event here. Uh, what we want to do is partner with unique managers. And so this group on the stage here is uh, potentially the most unique uh, managers in the world. You'll hear that from some of the positions that, that we'll talk about today. Um, I want to thank our moderator and uh, the keynote speaker, Scott Miller. Uh, Scott was instrumental in uh, bringing this group together, uh, as well as uh, Jessica Greer from uh, Willow Oak Asset Management as well. So I'll do a brief introduction of each panelist, uh, and then I'll introduce uh, Scott. Uh, Scott will give a keynote for about 15 minutes or so, uh, and Scott will be talking about um, how to choose uh, emerging managers, how he looks at them, uh, how he decides uh, which ones are actually talented and, and uh, perhaps which ones he doesn't want to partner with, um, or certain characteristics. So Scott will come up there at that point, and then he'll moderate this discussion. We'll have about 30 minutes of Q&A after that, and then we do have, I think, plenty of time afterwards. Uh, the, the bar will still be open. Um, we'd love to talk one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with all of you as well. Okay, I'll go down the row, probably the best way to do the introductions here. Uh, Jessica Greer, she is the Vice President of Willow Oak Asset Management. Fix the screen there. Um, she leads the, the teams, the fund management services, which are outsourced operations for emerging managers. Uh, prior to her current role, Jessica spent nearly two decades building and managing strategic operations and development programs in the private sector. Uh, she also serves as the Vice President and Chief of Staff for Willow Oaks parent company, Enterprise Diversified. Bill Chen uh, from Rizome Partners. Uh, Bill is uh, the managing partner there. He's a deep value and special situations uh, investor focusing on public-private arbitrage of real estate assets, distressed investing in companies trading at low multiples of traditional valuation <laughs> metrics. Uh, Bill started his career as a man mechanical engineer uh, before becoming a real estate analyst and director of research at a private equity firm. Uh, for me, the way I got to know Bill is because he is a prolific contributor to Sum Zero as well. So Bill has a lot of great ideas and he, he shares them uh, freely. Uh, Scott as well, well, we'll introduce Scott in a moment. Um, Dan Roller from Marin Capital. Uh, he's a portfolio manager there, a fund he started in 2015 named after his two daughters. Dan focuses uh, in the most inefficient areas of the market, he takes a bottom-up approach, has a concentrated portfolio. Uh, prior to starting Marin, Dan worked for more than a decade uh, as a research analyst and portfolio manager for various uh, New York hedge funds. Uh, following the model of, of differentiated backgrounds, Dan's undergrad degree is in electrical engineering and computer science. Keith Smith, uh, next. Keith is the portfolio manager for Bonhoeffer Fund. Uh, this is a fund he started with the help of Willow Oak Asset Management. Uh, the fund is named after the German theologian uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose uh, opposition to the Nazi regime ultimately led to his execution. So this is a, a meaningful story for, for Keith, um, and the name represents his independent thinking. And I'd say from my personal experience, knowing Keith very well, uh, it also represents his personal integrity. He's also a director of Enterprise Diversified. Uh, before launching Bonhoeffer with Willow Oak, uh, he was a uh, managing partner at Empire Valuation Consultants in Rochester. Before that, he was a captain in the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> Matt Sweeney. So Matt uh, is Laughing Water Capital. Uh, he, the unique name captures the uniqueness of Matt's portfolio as well, if, if uh, you learn about some of his holdings. He takes concentrated positions primarily in businesses with heavy alignment through insider ownership. He has a patient long-term focus. Uh, prior to forming Laughing Water, he held positions at Boyer Value Group and, and Cantor Fitzgerald. Next to him, Rudy Vandekirk. Uh, Rudy is in, uh, he might be the most unique one, he's in South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa. He recently started Desert Lion Capital with the help of Greenhaven Road in order to meet the needs of non-South African investors looking to invest in the unfrequented South African market. Prior to starting Desert Lion, 
Rudy had established Gascora, a permanent capital vehicle for South African investors, and Magnus Opus, an investment partnership primarily for friends and family. And finally, at the end, uh, David Waters. David is the founder and manager of Alluvial Fund. He focuses on value opportunities in small companies and thinly traded issues in inefficient areas of the market. Uh, Dave, Dave invests both in these, these types of companies domestically and internationally. Uh, he's also written prolifically at his blog, otcadventures.com, beginning in 2012. That's how I first learned of Dave and, and how we got to become friends. Uh, through the years, uh, we were lucky enough then for Willow Oak to have the opportunity uh, to become strategic partners with Alluvial in 2016. Uh, Dave's knowledge of small and micro cap companies, both domestically and internationally, in my opinion, is unparalleled. So with that, we have uh, Scott Miller, the star, <laughs> with all the pressure. Yeah. All right, is that my intro? <laughs> That's not the intro. <laughs> so Scott is the founder of Green Hill. Most of you probably do know Scott, but for posterity's sake, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background information. He is the, the founder of Greenhaven Road Capital. Uh, Greenhaven Road is a boutique investment partnership. It seeks off the beaten path investments in public equities. He also manages Greenhaven Road Partners, a fund that invests in talented emerging managers. Scott's research brings him to areas of the market where discarded, misunderstood, and esoteric companies reside. He also applies a concentrated style, applying a private equity-like research approach to the public markets. Now, when prospective portfolio managers ask me for advice, on what fund they should model themselves after, I always tell them Greenhaven Road and Scott Miller. That's the introduction. That's <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, Scott. All right, Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, you're on. All right. Uh, okay. I'm going to actually see if we can get down off this podium. I don't know. Okay. So. Uh, I think Stephen talked about who I am a little bit. Um, I definitely like to write more than I like to talk, um, so this will be interesting. Um, I'm at the core fund manager, right? I, I see asymmetric situations uh, with a value focus. It may not look at value uh, at, on the surface, doesn't screen well. That's when I kind of get interested. Um, I want to make this a little more interactive. So um, who are you, OK? Uh, Raise your hand if you own more than one share of Berkshire, not like the one share to get in the building. Like, really own it. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're invested in one of these managers. All right, cool. And raise your hand if you followed one of these managers into a stock. Okay, cool. So I just want to put a disclaimer out right now. Uh, nothing we're going to say is like a recommendation to invest. Do your own homework, right? And I'm probably conflicted. If I'm saying something, I want these guys to do the best. I probably have a financial relationship or something with them, and so just assume I am with that, with that disclaimer, okay? I'm on their side. Okay, so uh, raise your hand if you're a real Buffett historian. Like, really know the, really know the good stuff. Uh, there's a chance to win Drake tickets. So, someone come on up. A Buffett historian, come on up. We're going to need you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is raise your hand if you're a math guy. Not like, you know, quantum physics or whatever. Like, like, like pretty good. Or woman, math woman. All right, we got a math guy. Wait, you were both? Uh, or you're just part of Drake. <laughs> <laughs> I really want a whiskey, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fascinating. All right, so. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you guys have probably seen some version of this quote, right? It says, you know, Buffett says basically, you know, it's a huge advantage to be small. And, uh, you know, okay. So this is where the Buffett historian comes into play. Um, and the drink tickets. Okay, so the question is, in, oh, by the way, uh, Tim Erickson is somewhere. He's the source of this data, more or less. And so if you like it, Tim's the man. And if you don't, Tim's the man. <laughs> uh, okay, so the question is, Sanborn Matt, right? When he invested, what was the approximate value in 2019 dollars? Right, they just put 10 billion bucks into Occidental. So 56, 57. Yeah, why not for uh, first in business? Mm, 40, what do you guys think? Drink ticket or no drink ticket? Uh, 14 million, yeah, everybody else. Yeah, yeah. That's worth it. Drink, all right, here you go, drink ticket. 
Expected value is higher, right? Yeah. Okay. So the point here is like, you know, maybe it makes sense to swing, like, like the. Here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is that it's disproportionate, right? The the reward for if you can compound at high rates, right? And so that's why we're all trying to move down, right? The the compounding. So that's it. That's it. We're good. Thank no you. more math. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. This is for everyone, and no drink tickets. Get your own drinks. Um, Okay, so it's a, you know, we had, we quoted Buffett, so we have to quote Bunker. Um, concentration, right? So how common is concentration? Um, this this data is from uh, investor Sean Knoll. He did it at uh, ValueX. Again, if you like the data and agree with it, Sean, if you disagree. But I think directionally, we're it's as good as I could find, okay? Um, 174,000 uh, investment entities in the world. Now, that's people that file their holdings. Right? So actually, none of the managers up here would probably be considered an investment entity to Sean. And um, you know, so it tends to be larger, uh, pools of capital, et cetera. Uh, 86 trillion represented. OK, so the question is, uh, of the firms, how many have just one 5% position or bigger? Right. So um, what percentage? Or, or how, it's, the question is, what percent? OK. Yeah. 10%? Any, uh, let's see how lots of answers. Three? Three? Three. One. 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 All right. Again, Sean Knoll. I hope you're right. It's pretty rare, according to Sean. Uh, wow. Half a percent. Right? Like, you, you, we're here, in, we're in home now. So, like, oh, everyone, you know, you believe you buy, but like, not so much. Right? And so, you know, <coughs> conviction's rare, right? Uh, returns really matter. And small gives you an edge, right? Those are I, just like three ideas. I'm, for most of you, that's like, okay, duh, we, we know that. But it, just wanted to kind of get it out there. 
I'll tell you a quick story about why I think about managers, because you're like, well, you're a fund manager. Why do you think about other managers? Um, a couple years ago, I think three years ago, my father-in-law came to me with a good problem. He said, we have some money uh, that we'd like you to invest for the benefit of your wife and kids. Um, it's not like an enormous amount of money, but like enough that you should care. Um, and, uh, you know, your life savings is in your fund. My, you know, like my daughter's retirement fund is in your fund. And, you know, the kids have money in your fund. He's like, this is going to be outside the fund, right? So the good news is there's money. The bad news is you can't just put it in your fund. Um, so I could, like, you know, come up with another 15 good ideas, right? That's like, yeah, it's hard enough to come up with my first 15 good ideas. We could just put it in an index fund, right? And, but, you know, I, I want to move down that, I want to move down that return ladder, right? And try, try and compound at 15, 20, you know, as high as we can. And so, um, you know, I start, started thinking that my inbox basically was the smartest people I knew and was there an opportunity to, um, Trying to do a fund of funds, invest in those guys or, and women, right? Um, and so um, these are the attributes that I started thinking about in terms of what I wanted in, in managers. Um, and this is the one I feel the least convicted about, right? But it's one person investment committee. Um, and my point is, I don't think the you know the great returns are going to come from multi-strategy funds, right? If I had to give my family money for 30 years, like maybe, but you know. Uh, I think it's probably coming from one person investment committee's kind of simple shops, um, and concentrated, right? Like, are we really going to outperform owning 299 of the 500 companies in the S&P? Like, maybe, but I, I couldn't do it. And you know, as I think about kind of the universe of where we want to put money, that's not so high. Uh, back to the Buffett thing of, of size and structural advantage. Um, so you know, reasonable amounts of capital, right? Like. There's a whole, now this is a different room, but there's a whole group of people that are like, oh, you don't manage, you know, you're under 200 million, I won't touch you, right? But like, I actually think that's fundamentally wrong. Now, they may have kind of agency issues where it's, you know, they don't want to risk losing their job, and I, I totally get it. But like, for my money, uh, you know, smaller is not so bad. Um, and to me, this is a big one, right? So, you know, I have the vast majority of my savings in my fund, I care. I know how much I care, and I, the guys to invest with to care too, right? I just, you know, so it's, it's not heads I win, tails they lose, or whatever. We're in it together. Original thinking, right? So look, look at this room, look at this town, right? There's so many guys looking for ideas, looking to piggyback on people. Um, you know, original thinking is going to be, I think, the source of returns, or a, big, a big part of it, and that's kind of one of the criteria we have. And the last one, which is really hard to kind of figure out, but is of mindset, where getting rich is not the point, right? And so, I'd rather invest with somebody who, you know, is thinking about Ferrari and, and their margins and the release cadence of the new models and the SUV and the acceptance versus a guy who's like, I want a red Ferrari with this, you know, interior. <laughs> and like, we want him to think about the business, et cetera. And so um, we ended up creating something called the Partners Fund, which we're not here to talk about, but, you know, that exists to invest in small managers. Um, I thought I'd give oh, just a couple ideas on, on diligence. Uh, just because I've done it a bunch, and again, it's not clear I'm the best in the world at this by any means, but um, probably more like you as you would approach investing in other managers than, than most people are. Uh, so I, I think there are kind of three things for me. I really look at old letters. Like to me, the letters are, are where I get philosophical alignment and understand if I'm comfortable or not. It's where I, un like, the numbers absent, like how and why someone invested, to me is like really difficult. Like you send me a tear sheet, I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. Right? Like, okay, your sharp ratio is whatever, but like, is it repeatable? And like, you know, were you right or, or you were wrong, but you got lucky? And, you know, so the letters kind of, particularly if there's a multi year period, are really helpful to kind of fill in the blanks. Um, honestly, not that many people ask me for my audit. <laughs> like, the audit is where, you know, we connect, like, what, what, what you say and, and what's in the portfolio. And um, uh, you can see kind of personal investment, there's a lot in there. And, and so I go there. And then uh, I think the final thing is signals, right? Um, are like former bosses, uh, mentors invested in the fund, right? Like that's a pretty interesting signal. Uh, you know, is, is someone trying to back the person in some way? And you know, they're just, uh, it, it's mainly who else is betting on them? And like how big is the personal investment, right? Like, you know, I understand not everyone comes from like enormous pots of, of wealth, right? But like, 
if you want to invest alongside, I hope at some point you compound at a decent rate so you have enough, you know, you have some money in, in, in the fund. So um, those are kind of some thoughts on, on manager selection and diligence and, and how I think about it. Um, so but you basically came for the panelists. Um, so do you have a couple of facts on the panelists? And, and I think they kind of tie back to the, the, last, the last piece. Uh, you know, average size of investment committee of this group is, is one, <laughs> precisely. Uh, I, I believe all have at least a 5% position. Um, I think they all have reasonable AUM. And I may be wrong on this, but I think basically none of them have a top position in the S&P 500. And my point here is, look, you guys can all go buy an index fund. Anyone can. And, and maybe you should. Portion of you, whatever you want to do. But like these guys are effectively doing something. They're craftsmen, right? And this is, they're not the S&P 500. They will go into kind of a little bit what they do. These are like idiosyncratic. And you know, it doesn't mean they're going to work, but they're different. Um, and so that's, that's what we got. Um, now we do a panel. <laughs> <laughs> no okay. more drink tickets? <laughs> uh, audience questions. You get drink tickets for that. And by the way, best audience question gets a tattoo. <laughs> Warren Buffett tattoo. Only one of those. Okay. Okay, so um, look, we have a lot of panelists, right? And we don't have that much time. And these guys are all super knowledgeable about their companies and, and what they do, right? And so the, ho the hope is, and the request of them is they give shorter answers. Right, these are teaser answers. Everyone will be around afterwards. You can get a beer. They have emails, and so um, they're not just supposed to give their total knowledge of, of a topic. It's it's kind of just just the headlines, if you will. Um, so with that kind of ground rule, um, I guess we'll we'll just start the first question. We'll just kind of go down the down the row because we'll do like a kind of like a speed round. And the, the question is, uh, in 50 words or less, what's your biggest position? Roughly how big is it? And what? What is the misunderstanding with that company? Like All right, so uh, when they invited me, they didn't tell me I was going to go first. Uh, biggest position is Howard Hughes, about 15% of position, but since we're on the, you know, small being a theme here, uh, second biggest position is a company called Griffin. It's a warehouse. Uh, it trades at 10% uh, cap rate when you back out excess real estate. Uh, That's the 50 words. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have uh, MMA Capital, ticker MMAC. It's about a $200 million niche uh, investment company. How many words am I in? It's 22% <laughs> of the portfolio. 22% of the portfolio, so uh, I'm concentrated. And uh, I, I think the misunderstanding is it's, it's, it has a somewhat complicated story and background. It's probably too complicated uh, for its size to attract larger, larger funds, uh, so there's an opportunity for, for us smaller funds. Uh, my largest position is a company called Claris Corporation. Um, it's over 25% of the capital of the fund. And um, it's, it's run by an owner-operator who owns over 20% of the business. Um, so I think there's really good alignment, good secular growth. And he employs and has successfully employed in the past what I call a buy and build strategy of growing the portfolio companies and also working for, uh, for, yeah. for additional deals. Okay, um, I'm Keith Smith. Our, our biggest position is Boozy Unisem Saving Shares. Um, it's an Italian cement company whose most, uh, most of their operations are in the U.S. The biggest misunderstanding of the business is since it trades in Italy, um, the focus is more on the Italian business versus the U.S. business. U.S. business has got some really interesting characteristics and also the voting versus non-voting shares. The non-voting shares trade at a significant discount to the voting shares, which in my opinion they probably really shouldn't because of the the way that the shareholder structure is set up. Matt Sweeney, the biggest position is a company called Flowtech, ticker is FTK. It's a 15% position right now. And the biggest understanding is that if you were to look at this company today in any kind of screener, you would see a $200 million market cap with $40 million in debt. And next Thursday, it'll actually be a company with an $80 million market cap and no debt. And that'll be trading below net current asset value. Biggest position, 16%. It's a South African IT services and solutions and financial services company. 35% return on tangible equity. Very little debt. Growing earnings at more than 20% per year. 
Um, 145 million shares outstanding, even a market cap of 2.4 billion, that's 170 billion, uh, million dollars. 500 million rand in profit, that's 35 million, so it's an after-tax PE multiple of 4.9. It's misunderstood because the market still thinks of it as an IT hardware box dropper. They misunderstood the transformation the company made into um, services and solutions and into financial services. And I'll That's say the name. Off that accent, but <laughs> I I'll say the name in return for drink tickets afterwards. New Bear Communications. New Bear Communications is 11 percent of Louisville, of Louisville Fund. It's a Minnesota traditional telecom. Everyone thinks traditional telecom is dead. Wireline is in endless decline. Not true. Uh, they're rolling out fiber at a rapid rate, a double-digit free cash flow yield, and massive subsidy from the government looking to roll out broadband to all Americans. All right, thanks, guys. Um, let's start at the end this time with Dave. Uh, so we have a sophisticated group of folks in the crowd. Um, I think it'd be interesting to hear um, when someone gives you an idea or a name, and they literally say, hey, this is the company, but not much more. What are the first thi two things you look at to figure out, like, if you want to actually dive in and do work? Kind of like the, the filters, the screeners, like, no, go, no, go type of thing. Sure. Size and liquidity are important to me. Uh, if it's small, if it doesn't trade a whole lot, there's a higher chance the market doesn't really know what's here. If it's big and liquid, probably 50 other analysts are looking at it, and there's low chance I can add much value there. I want to see who the people are who are running it. Have they done well in the past? Are they ethical? Are they honest? Do they have, are they respected in the industry? I want to see if the company is cash flowing. Which way are the margins going? Do they invest that cash productively? And what is the, what's the future look like for this company? <coughs> Sustainable return on capital employed, management, growth outlook. My working assumption is that I'm the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to believe, I know. But uh, <laughs> when I'm looking at a stock, I want to understand why is it cheap, because there's a lot of smart people out there. So I want to understand what would make it cheap. And most often, that, that requires what I refer to as a change in the matrix, because ordinarily, the market is pretty efficient. But if something happens, then maybe somebody's selling for the wrong reason or something like that that could make it an attractive entry point. So on the more subjective side, it could be maybe it's a good company, but it's actually better than anyone realizes. On the more objective side, um, like one of my largest positions now, the largest shareholder died and is liquidating his stake. That's an attractive point to buy at. Um, well, okay, so, so, so the, th the three things I look for are, um, there's, there's three frameworks I use in terms of a, sort of a screen selection. I try to look for what I describe as sort of compound mispricings, which means both the underlying security and the security and the capital structure are somehow not priced correctly. And so in my mind, that's a, that gets me excited about security when someone talks about that. Another sort of group of companies I look at, wh what I primarily do is look for companies that are sort of following these three themes. The second theme is sort of private LVO companies, companies that basically may have a good amount of debt, but the debt is sustainable. <coughs> and the third one are sort of mischaracterized firms, firms that may be cyclical, that may look like one type of firm, but economically they're different. And therefore the, the market may be mispricing it at a certain period of time, but as the, the firm grows and as time goes on, the, the realization that the company may be a little bit not quite as cyclical or not quite as sort of um, up and downsy in terms of their actual performance once they realize in the market it provides some upside. So those are sort of the three themes that I use as filters to at least they get me interested in the company. Thanks. I, I, I tend to care a lot about alignment. So I look at insider ownership and I'm learning more and more that skin in the game or alignment is not necessarily like real alignment. So I think you need to look, you know, someone might own a lot but also still have um, conflicting uh, incentives. So that's one thing. And then at Value X Vale a couple years ago, sorry, um, so someone uh, someone said, and I'm, oh. I'm forgetting who, maybe someone up here on the panel can remind me, but someone said the price asks the question. And so I think that, you know, I, I came across a real estate company once where all you had to do was prove that they owned the land, they said they did, and this thing was cheap. So, so it was just, is the land there or not? Um, or there was another example that a couple of us invested in 
we studied Swedish takeover law from day one. If we understand Swedish takeover law, we can underwrite this investment. So I think that there's, there's elements like that um, that, that, I'll, that I'll frequently look for. The price and the situation ask the question. Okay, and I'll re-up the question again here since we've had a few answers. The, the question is, you hear the name of a company, how do you determine whether you want to look further into it or not? That's the rough approximation of it. For me, if it's potentially a long-term holding, what kind of car does the CEO drive? How fancy is his office? And that, that'll tell you a lot about his decision-making within the company itself. Um, so I think I'm going to power what other people said is the first thing that we do is try to understand why, the, you know, is there a reason for it to trade cheap? Uh, is this an orphan company? Is there a, we love situations where share, th there's no natural shareholder base. So it could be a REIT that's suspended dividend. It could be an MLP that's suspended dividend. It, it could just be that there's a natural shareholder base at one point and that got washed out or there's a time arbit arbitrage situation. And in terms of furthering our process, I think there's two things we do. Uh, management is fun extremely important. Uh, we always want to get inside their head and see if they're truly aligned or not. And then on the real estate side, since half of our book is real estate related, uh, getting out there, you know, uh, hit the pavement, kick the, uh, kick the tires. Uh, I think uh, pictures with a thousand words, and uh, we love to be on the ground. Oh, thank you, guys. Um, I don't know, let's, let's just start in the middle with Dan then. Uh, so there are literally thousands of funds. Um, there's some, you know, guys have huge research budgets, right, that are like multiples of like, you know, all of us combined, right? Uh, I, I guess it's like, if you, do you think you have an edge? What is it? Why do you think you have like the right to compete against these, you know, big guys? <coughs> okay, thanks. Um, I think there's a couple sources of edge. Um, I think there's structural sources. Uh, maybe kind of research or process sources of edge, and then also hopefully behavioral sources of edge. And I think on the structural sources of edge, just a small size, you know, some of those points that Scott made earlier, a small size, a single decision maker, a long-term horizon. Um, in my fund, I have a five-year lockup share class, and that's by far the most common share class. So I think that's a source of structural edge for me compared to a lot of fund managers. It allows me to look at smaller off the beaten path companies and hold them and I you know I tell my investors look I'm going to likely be more volatile than various other alternatives but there's a reason that we're doing what we're doing and so I think there's a structural edge and then I think there's a you know research or analytical edge um, hopefully w you know just given my background in fund management for 12 years working at you know bigger New York hedge funds I think I learned a certain level of rigor and now I'm applying that to companies that generally don't have that type of rigor so I'm not competing against firms with those big research budgets for the most part. These companies are too small for them to look at. And then hopefully over time, I've um, succeeded in building a, a behavioral edge, which just kind of speaks to um, you know, being patient and, and how I act during periods of volatility. And um, I, I think that's a, a source of edge um, that I can maintain versus you know, other people, again, with um, investment committees tapping on their shoulder or, or other factors that they're thinking about besides you know, just simply do I want to own this for the long term or not? If you don't mind, ooh, Go ahead. that one's loud. Uh, if you don't mind me jumping in, I would just say on the um, like the informational edge, my experience, I, mean, I understand what Dan is saying about fishing in the right ponds, but my experience, um, I used to think that I was finding things that no one in the world was finding, and I realized that that is definitely not true. I don't think there's ever been a time where I wrote a letter that included an idea where I didn't get an email from somebody that's saying, oh yeah, I own that too. And it's not professional fund managers at a lot of times. Like I had one time where it was a school teacher from Brooklyn who had never worked in anything except education, but he had found the same stock that I found where I felt like nobody else in the world knew it and it was probably a five bagger in the next three years. And he was telling me where I was wrong on things and it helped my research process to have that. So I think the, the informational edge is harder. The structural edge is the more important part and I think that's where everyone on this panel benefits from basically aligning yourself and committing to a strategy that is designed to find these smaller things. Because if you set yourself up where you have a bigger over overhead, uh, a bigger investment committee, everything like that, you need to raise more assets to just justify those expenses. So making those structural decisions automatically takes you out of the pool where the most ideas are. So yeah. it really goes back to the structural and behavioral. T to Matt's point, I guess, except for an IPO, every share of stock you buy, someone is selling it to you. So they've, they've owned it, they've been there, and you're buying it. So I think that it's a fair point. 
Yeah, I think I think part of in terms of edges that that people can bring a lot of it has to do with sort of your, your some of it has to do with your background. My background's been in business appraisal for 20 years. So I've done deep dives looking at companies on the inside and sort of being able to take a look at that. But some of the other aspects I think that work towards my style that, I, that I've sort of focused on has been sort of these compound mispricings, taking a look at the discounts that are really applicable for various companies over time. And what those things can actually provide, which is an interesting edge, is that a lot of whether these discounts get wider or larger are independent of sort of the way the market moves. So you can provide, get, getting those additional sort of aspects and looking at it from that perspective, I think provides me a little bit of an edge over, let's say, sort of other traditional managers. But the, but the other thing too is, is these guys have said this, the structural and just being able to, to make a decision and not have to ha have an investment committee really really makes a, makes a big difference. And then also just sort of, sort of where you're looking. Um, one of the things that, when, and a lot of our stocks that we own in Bonhoeffer are sort of in markets where, you know, the, the institutions have access to it, but individuals really don't. And, and the issue is, is that this, since we're relatively small, we can basically take advantage of buying, like an example, is buying some of the smaller preferred stocks in Korea. A lot of institutional shareholders have access to those, but the floats are so small that they would never, they would never, it, didn't, it doesn't make sense for them to actually own them but we can actually own them and sort of see the economics of those particular situations play out. Can I, I want to ask a uh, question of the audience. Uh, to Dan's point, the three kind of edges, which to paraphrase time, information, and emotion, we generally agree those are kind of three, the three major edges, if not all of the, the potential edges. Uh, who thinks uh, time is the most important? So we have about 15% or so. What about emotion? Who thinks kind of the emotional arbitrage? That's, that's more. And then information. Who thinks the information is? So it's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a mix. So we have different opinions probably of anyone who raised their hands, let's say a third each. Um, and we might disagree on this as well. But in my view, uh, time arbitrage is the absolute greatest advantage. If you truly understand compounding and you have the ability uh, the analytical ability or perhaps the insight into a company that has a long, long runway, then you have the greatest advantage. It doesn't matter if you're an individual investor. It doesn't matter if you're a, a small fund or a large fund. If you have the ability to buy MasterCard at the IPO and over the last 23 years hold it for the entire time and get 20% plus, that's how you get those numbers out here that we've been talking about. Now, that includes some emotional, you know, you have to have the emotional stability to, to own it through the ups and downs. Um, but you can control emotional stability with, by extending your time duration, in my opinion. I think I just want to echo that, you know, the time, emotion, and, uh, um, you know, I just want to add more detail. I think, I think industry expertise matters a lot, uh, you know, to what Keith mentioned. You know, we come, I, I personally come from very much a hard asset, real estate background, you know, had experience in mechanical and HVAC engineering, was at City doing real estate investment bank. And then when you think about circle competence, I mean, that's certainly where we start and about 50% of our investments are in highly concentrated 10% plus real estate positions where we've flown to places, they stay two weeks, visited locations. So that's certainly an area of edge, you know, if you have, an area of industry expertise certainly uh, focus, you know, a little more energy on that. And then, you know, certainly agree on the time of charge and just want to add more detail on, I'm probably the lowest gross exposure manager up here. And uh, we think that, you know, having and to, to the emotional and um, holding cash or utilizing put strategies, it, it's, you know, we do pre-mortems on my emotions, emotional state in an 08, 09 scenario. And I ask myself, how would I behave if the market went down 20% and how do I structure my portfolio that way? And I think that we actively go out and we'll spend about 1% of the AUM a year to buy, uh, you know, puts on our la larger positions or buy puts or hedge, you know, uh, a basket of uh, common uh, companies in the same industry. and that th that way when the market does go haywire one we have the dry powder that shows up as windfall and emotionally i'm just in a better state and so i imagine what kind of bad place i could be in and i try to uh, position myself so that uh, i don't wind up there where i just had the dry powder to own more of the companies i like yeah so if i can just 
put in something here, and I don't want to repeat what everyone has said. We've got a very nice crowd who's participating, so I've got a question for the crowd as well. What do you think is the single most important characteristic of a successful investor? Just shout out one word. Just shout it out. Self uh, we've got self-awareness. What else? Rational. Rational. Patience. Patience. Ethical. Ethical. Active, Active engagement. Two words. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, I think the single most important <laughs> characteristic that you need to be a successful investor is temperament. And I think temperament is something that can be cultivated, but you inherently have it or not. You can develop it to a certain extent, but you inherently have it or not. And with regards to the informational edge, um, I think there are certain markets where it's tougher to have an informational edge as opposed to other markets. For example, in the markets where I'm playing in South Africa, I frequently rock up to an AGM, and I am this single shell that the AGM is held in a boardroom, and I'm the single guy there. And so everything is above board. You can ask what you want to ask, but it's not a results presentation. It's not in the annual report. So they can divulge information in a public forum, but you're the only <laughs> person there. So it's proprietary <laughs> information. <laughs> I, I've long thought that you actually pay a high price for liquidity. And so we've structured a little bit of fun around the idea that we are willing and delighted to hold things that may not trade that day, may not trade that week, that we could not sell if we wanted to today. We could in time. But I found that larger funds are just allergic to the idea of buying anything where they couldn't hit the eject button the next minute and, and be out of it, or at least within a few days or weeks. Just examples, we own a company called Tower Properties, which has a share price of 21000 and change, trades a share or two some days, other days none. Uh, nonetheless, wonderful company, huge discount to net asset value, good balance sheet, well run. Our portfolio is full of things like that, and we're, we're always looking for more. So uh, I'd rather sit there and collect that premium, and, and sometimes the, the waiting can be painful. I, I know that Steve and I both own uh, MMA, uh, and we've had to wait sometimes a long while for that stock price to move, even as the underlying value uh, c compounds itself. And if you're a large manager, sometimes you don't have the liberty of waiting around for the stock price to respond. You probably have a set of partners and clients who demand constant outperformance, and, and that's another luxury of being a smaller manager, is the demands placed on you are sometimes smaller, and if you've created your LP and client base, well, you have people who understand what you're doing and are willing to be more patient and realize that sometimes the best returns are achieved in a short period after a long period of frustration and inactivity. Yeah, and, and to Dave's point, I mean, one of the uh, large portion of our, our portfolio is involved in those kind of situations where liquidity is a bigger end. Another thing that thing that we've seen in some of the positions is you can you don't necessarily see, let's say, what I would say is an active catalyst, but you see the environment of a catalyst moving forward. An example would be some of these Korean preferred shares. Like saying the liquidity of some of them for larger funds, they really they they would not want to do it because they couldn't press the button and get out right away. But the, the, the general trajectory of what's going on in Korea, and there's no specific catalyst, otherwise the price would move, but the general characteristic of what's going on there is creating the environment to allow the discounts to close. And so if we look at where we're sort of investing, we're looking for countries or opportunities where the governance is getting better, and that really provides somewhat of a, not a hard catalyst, but a soft catalyst to basically create things in the environment for catalysts to actually happen and some of the value shrinkage there to actually you know, be realized from that perspective. And, uh, I guess while we're talking about this, to bring Jessica into the discussion a little bit here since uh, she's been on stage and hasn't had the chance to say anything, you know, handling the operation side of, of businesses, uh, funds like we are with these eclectic, interesting uh, portfolios that also self-select uh, investors, uh, investors into our fund, um, who, who understand and appreciate our approach. I'd be interested to hear uh, what it's like from the investor relations side and, and the operational um, uh, you know, assistance uh, to our, what's it like dealing with our investors? That's the question. <laughs> uh, a rare treat. Um, no, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, for those of you wondering, we bought our way onto this panel by um, sponsoring the bar. So if you're looking <laughs> for a drink ticket, see me after. Um, 
No, it's, it's wonderful. Um, we uh, have a lot of confidence in the infrastructure we're building for these guys, a lot of them, all of them. One man shops. Um, we want them. We want to address the pain points so that they can focus on the portfolio. And from the investor's perspective, we believe that's a true value add for you, for them, um, for all involved. So um, I'm delighted to talk more about our services. We actually provided a uh, pamphlet, um, which were on the seats and and at the uh, registration desk. But um, it's it's a joy working with each of them because. We see the value in um, increasing their visibility and growing the network um, of these talented individuals. Yeah, I think what, what we see too is there's a lot of overlap in those who are interested in these types of portfolios. Even though we all have a uh, similar underlying philosophy, it gets applied in a different way. So we have a little bit of overlap in holdings, but surprisingly li little, uh, to be honest. Um, may maybe no more than one or two each um, and, and not those kind of largest positions. Uh, so we certainly appreciate the research and the thinking behind uh, what, what each of us does, uh, and it, it is beneficial for idea sourcing, um, but we all come at it in a slightly different way. So the reason why, in my opinion, uh, you know, Scott started this, the, the Partners Fund, uh, or the benefit of, of the Partners Fund is you get access to the same philosophy, but, but applied with a slightly different strategy over and over. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I, I want to... See if we can talk a little bit about your information diets. Um, you know, kind of what what you're ingesting. Is there anything in particular like that that's in influencing you? Book, website, podcast, person on Twitter who you you, you think is like, you know, r really just kind of pushes your thinking. I, I mean, I think for me, one thing that I've looked at recently are models of companies that are actually growing. I'm I'm traditionally from sort of a deep value type of approach and looking at growing companies. And looking in de and sort of, and, and, the, and a lot of those businesses have a tendency to be in sort of like less capital intensive industries and, and, and basically businesses sort of like distribution kind of businesses and that are not capital intensive that basically can and have some really nice runways. And so I think for me, it's it, the areas that, that I've been growing is just thinking about those kind of businesses, some business models. So, for example, Ashteed would be an example of a, of a company I've looked at now that I've gotten pretty excited about just because of the traditional, everybody's looking at it as sort of a traditional cyclical business, but it has a lot of non-cyclical components to it that I don't think the market is really recognizing. And as the company matures, it's actually changing. And, and when you get those kind of businesses where they change over time, I don't think the market is really sort of reflecting those changes. And that's sort of interesting and exciting for me from that perspective. So that's... I think the first two people. I like the idea of uh, follow a lot of uh, podcasts and people on Twitter and blogs and things like that about how to think and how to improve your judgment. Uh, there's uh, someone by the name of Josh Wolf from Lux Capital who's who's been great on Twitter. Uh, he's got a great quote. It's failure is the failure to imagine failure, <laughs> right? So that's a, that's a great quote, and I think you know, all of our, the environment that we each create for ourselves about how to, how to think effectively and how to make sure our reality and our judgment on that is uh, closest to what reality actually is, is, um, is, w is one of the biggest keys, I think, to the success. Yeah, I, I actually think that we are confronted with a flood of information and most investors are voracious readers and we're trying to consume all of the knowledge, Twitter, everything that you can read, um, newspapers, books, podcasts, and I think that we think too, mi too little. So what I try to do is uh, actually spend a lot more time thinking uh, in the w words of uh, Howard Marks. Um, he said, risk is because more things can happen than what will happen. And I think we need to spend more time thinking. We're in the age of information overload. And I think spending more time thinking might be an edge to you as an investor. Anyone, anyone else? I'll say I like long walks on the beach and <laughs> thinking deeply. <laughs> Nothing to add. <laughs> 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 All right, fair enough, guys. Uh, I think I think you know it's interesting. To, it'd be interesting, at least to me, uh, 
to hear about like your heroes are who who a hero is on a, from the management side, right? So we're all investors, we're all backing companies. If if there's one kind of if you had Mount Rushmore of management, you kind of got one person to put up. Who would it be and why? In you know, two hundred words or less. So we we probably could all agree on the the real Mount Rushmore of managements, um, but I'll name one that I think is somewhat under the radar. It's the chairman of this company, Claris Corporation, that I mentioned. Um, his prior vehicle was Armor Holdings, which he took from $0.75 cents a share to $88 a share in 12 years. So it was a 100-plus hundred, hundred bagger in 12 years. And I think that he's really under the radar. And now I think it's interesting. You have someone of this caliber who's built and sold you know, half a half, uh, five, five billion dollar company, excuse me, $4.5 billion company, who's now the chairman of basically a micro cap. It's a couple hundred million dollar company. Um, but I think his career is, is worth, worth studying, and he's very patient, very disciplined, really good deal guy, um, you know, builds a, a real company builder. Um, so he would be one for nomination that, that I think is pretty far off the radar. Look, Mark Leonard from Constellation Software is, is, is a legend, and most of us didn't know who he was five years ago. A lot of us probably do now over the last three, four years, but uh, it, it took him – 25 years to, to build that up to, to be known the last few years. Um, the cap, in terms of capital allocation from the CEO position, it, it's tough to beat. And you know he's written about how uh, he, he leads as an example, always flies coach, uh, you know, was, was as cheap as possible during tr for travel. Uh, as he got older, he was a taller guy, uh, difficult to sit in those seats. He wanted to fly first class, uh, so he just started paying it out of pocket. He'd fly for the company, pay, pay out of pocket himself. And then it turned out he just paid all of his travel out of pocket when he's traveling on behalf of the company. So that's the type of example that uh, goes down to the rest of the employees. They show that he has the company's best interest in mind, and he just happens to be a brilliant capital allocator as well. Could add on to that with one that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, but uh, Sergio Marchion from Fiat. And I think it's amazing to think about that that's a guy that had zero experience in the car business started in the car business and then became the best in the car business. And that ties back to what Steve was talking about, just about the capital allocation, and also ties back to what we were speaking earlier about um, you know, just behavioral advantages and the way that he's thinking about things, where he's not thinking about a car business necessarily, he's thinking about the way he's gonna allocate capital across. And it's shocking how few CEOs have that ability to kind of separate the two, the operations on one side and the capital allocation on the other and then bring them together in a way that can compound over longer periods of time. So someone like that with zero experience in an industry who can almost overnight become the best in an industry is super impressive. I mean, I think for me, probably the guy would be John Malone. And the thing that I really like about him, which may be a little bit different than what other people would see, is that he's really been able to provide a model of how to use leverage in a way that's not going to blow you up. I mean, that's the... Uh, my early in my career, that was my, my uh, career, but in my investing career, that was one of the things that I really had a problem with. And he, he set up certain metrics and ways of thinking about leverage and the types of business that make sense to put leverage on that for me, I think, has provided sort of an interesting model for people that want to take on leverage in a way that's not going to blow you up to really sort of follow or emulate. So if most of you won't be familiar with this name. It's South African... Uh, Yanni Maton, he was fired from a brokerage that uh, bought his name. He was one of the founders uh, at age 49, started a company called PSG at age 50. Um, and since 1995 to now, PSG has compounded with total return index uh, way in excess of 40% per year. And uh, Yanni has just stepped down as uh, the chairman, but uh, an exceptional capital app allocator and uh, business opportunist. Another slightly one, uh, one slightly off the radar is uh, the uh, father and son Shermer team at Meritage Hospitality. Took their company from running under 50 Wendy's units to over 300 over the past decade and multiplied shareholder wealth several hundred uh, several times over the same period. Uh, the younger Shermer was interviewed by a restaurant magazine a few years back and they asked him, what's your favorite movie to close the interview? And he said, Movies are boring. I can't see the movies. I'd rather think about Wendy's. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Got it. All right. Um, just in terms of like format, I think we're going to do kind of one more question for everybody, and then we'll do individual questions, like one for each person, and then audience questions. 
Um, so the the last question for everyone is if you if the spirit moves you, uh, kind of a, a one minute itch stock pitch, right? So like they'll be around. This is like the teaser. It's not the full all f going through every division and what they do and all that stuff, right? Just uh, s something you like. Um, not a stock recommendation. Do your own work. But <laughs> anyone, uh, anyone go first. By KKR. Sure, I'll I'll start with a with a teaser of an idea. About at 3:30, it was pretty late in the day. Someone asked Warren and Charlie um, what they would do if they were just managing a million dollars, and they said, "Well, one of the things we might try to do is um, arbitrage situations." So, there's a company that I've owned for a number of years called Turning Point Brands. It's um, they're in chewing tobacco. They own Zigzag Rolling Papers, um, and they're also getting into vaping and CBD. So, this is kind of a situation where, as a value investor, I can underwrite a really long history of solid profitability on the chewing tobacco business and maybe get a little bit of excitement on some of these, um, these newer things with, with vaping and CBD. Um, but the stock idea is a company called Standard Diversified, which owns 51% of Turning Point, and 98% of Standard Diversified assets are Turning Point brand shares. So Standard Diversified um, has a net asset value of around $523 million. Uh, 514 million of that is turning point brand shares, and it trades at 67 cents on the dollar. So there's, you could say there's a conglomerate discount or a warranted discount, but this is just, you know, it goes to Keith's point about compound mispricings. I like turning point over the next couple of years as they continue to grow the business. Um, but here's a chance where you're going to get, a, you know, 30% off sale, six to 67 cents on the dollar, but with no noise. There's no other divisions. There's no money losing thing on the side. It's just uh, a 67 cent dollar and that's all they own is this is, is turning point so worth a look Dan likes sin so he, you get the cigarettes and and the tobacco and things like that Claris has an ammunition division as well so he likes that <laughs> uh, anything that uh, y you know the, the world is is doing to this responsible kind of uh, whatever it's called in investing and Dan will take the opposite and Dan's gonna do better than them he is um, so my my choice is uh, probably West Aim uh, West Aim is a Canadian uh, asset manager, they have an insurance subsidiary and they also have a credit fund. Uh, the insurance subsidiary, uh, there likely will be some sort of uh, monetization of that in the near future. Uh, trades below about 10-15% below book value as is. And uh, once that insurance uh, company gets monetized, it will likely be a, a much higher uh, valuation, much higher book value and uh, de deserve a higher valuation as well. Well, you know, I think my, my choice would probably be Ashteed. It's a real interesting company. It's an equipment leasing business that's growing very rapidly. I think that sustainable growth is probably, its growth, it, right now it's probably growing, it's the sales growing 20% per year, earnings 30% per year. They probably have a real continued runway in the U.S. for another five to seven years. They're consolidating a very fragmented business. They have huge advantages over their smaller competitors, and it just, it's selling for a very reasonable price. Um, one of the things that, that I've noticed that I've had to sort of adjust my style to is I'm used to just doing more of deep value investing, but these growth type of companies, the interesting thing about them is that the longer you wait, if they continue to grow, the worse position you're in. So it's one of these kind of things where, you know, you can buy it and maybe not be as concerned about the price because the growth will hopefully take care of itself. It's to give you an idea of sort of the valuations at this point, the valuation of the companies in the low teens on an EPS basis, on a free cash flow basis, is probably in the upper single digits. So it's one of those kind of um, kind of situations where you get a combination of a really fast grower with a low multiple. The market concern about it is a cyclicality, but I think the cyclicality over, over time, you can just see what's happened to some of the margins. The margins are about 10% higher than they were at the last peak. As these businesses get bigger, they get better. So that's another interesting aspect. It's sort of a bricks and mortar business that has some internet type characteristics where as the company gets bigger, <coughs> it becomes more diversified, it gets less risky, and the margins go up and the company gets better. So it's if a real interesting dynamic. If I could just interrupt. Um, sure. Keith did a four page write up on this and you should read it is what I would say. Uh, it's, it's excellent. I, and, and I, but I also wanna say that for the vast majority of folks, generally you can get on their distribution list for their letters. Um, and I think it was an appendix to your last letter. And, and like, you know, to me, that's like gold, you know, pull over the car, s sit and read Keith's letter. And so, I mean, all, all these guys, right? Yeah, that's why yeah, they're no, here. Exactly, yeah. I, I, mean but the, uh, yeah. I, I would say that, like, he's going to give the teaser answer and he'll talk to you afterwards, but get on his distribution list. Like, it's good. Uh, uh, here, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, since we're giving out teasers, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll set up a, um, an idea uh, without the name, so it's a real teaser, you know, little twist. Uh, there's a about a $180 million kind of warehouse company out there where, so in case you guys haven't noticed, uh, e-commerce, you know, is kind of the way of the future, uh, which means that there's a lot of need for logistics and warehouses to store uh, boxes and whatnot, and um, the whole distribution chain is being uh, re kind of rearranged. And warehouses are trading on average of five percent cap rate. Uh, if you look at the really big uh, national warehouse REITs, they trade at about one hundred and one dollars a square foot. Uh, you can buy this company at about fifty eight dollars a square foot, and if you look at the quality of it, uh, they d they produce about. Six dollars a square foot of NOI, while the comp does five dollars. So you're getting it on sixty cents on a dollar, and yet the quality is higher. So um, you know every metric that you look at, uh, we own it for two years. It trades at the same price, so it's the same. Pr but over that two-year time period, the CEO actually created a ton of value. We gone back and looked at their lever return on equity, and it's in the mid twenties over eight-year time span. So it's a real teaser, and uh, we will probably uh, have some, you know, large slide deck on it coming up soon. So, uh, you know, uh, to to be determined. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would talk about a company called Iteris. Ticker is ITI. They have three segments, which are really two businesses. One of those businesses you could think of as traffic management, where they actually have a touch point with one third of all the stoplights you see in the United States. That business does around $9 million in free cash flow. The other business is basically a venture stage agricultural company, which I think that they will be shutting down very shortly. And that business basically obscures the true earnings potential of the company on a gap basis, because you have a, one that's making money and one that's losing money. And the agricultural business, to give you an idea why I think they're gonna shut it down, two years ago they actually separated it into a separate legal entity. And then a year and a half ago they hired a guy to run it who has seen the last four companies he was at get sold. So it's kind of writing on the wall for that business. So when that business goes away, all of a sudden on a gap basis, this company will look like it's trading at nine times free cash flow, excuse me, at, excuse me, doing $9 million in free cash flow. And if you just put a market multiple on that, you get around 20% upside, but it's also growing double digits and the strategic value is super high as evidenced by a recent private transaction, which happened at 4.7 times sales where this company trades at around 1.2 times sales. Scott, does yes. it have to be a legitimate teaser, or can we do a pump and dump as well? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll just continue with our biggest position, um, and we'll keep it anonymous. IP is uh, quite precious. We can ex exchange some IP for drink tickets. Um, this business, South African-based uh, IT services and solutions business and financial services business, it has three clusters. The one is a distribution cluster. The one is services and solutions. The one is financial services. They are taking market share over all three clusters. South African IT market is 277 billion rand and this company has only 6% market share. So they're operating scalable business model, um, they're innovative, very good management, making smart acquisitions, growing market share in a growing market with a lot of pent up demand, leading up to our general elections in South Africa coming next week, May 8. The last 18 months, many of the large corporates have put their fingers on the pause button, but we all know that you can't postpone IT spend at infinitum. Um, so we see some big IT spend coming through for this business. 35% return on tangible equity, very little debt, only 17% debt to equity, very, very high cash flow conversion. Uh, the manager um, was able over the past four years to uh, extract cash from working capital. The cash flow uh, conversion was about 150% trading at less than a five times PE. They've repurchased more than, uh, well, roughly 25% of their shares over the past three years at the less than a seven PE. And um, we can easily see that we're going to make uh, a three to four X over the next two to three years from this position. Okay. 
There's a trio of related and very liquid companies. They are Intergroup, Santa Fe Financial, and Portsmouth Square. Cross Holdings, very, very complicated, but really, really fun to figure out how many shares are actually out there and who owns what. Together, these three companies own uh, the San Francisco Financial District Hilton Hotel. Wonderful asset. I think if you take a look at how the market is valuing these companies and what that translates to on a per room, per key basis, you might find it really, really interesting. So check it out. Before you go on, I, I want to provide an additional warning about um, all of these ideas that we brought up here. As much as uh, I respect Manish Pabrai, I hate the idea of cloning. And, and the reason is the idea itself, you have to make it your own idea in some way. And you have to build the commitment to hold the idea. And hearing some interesting ideas here uh, and then going out and just buying it without without convincing yourself that it was your idea is very dangerous because you're not going to own it when it gets a little bit of volatility. You're going to be, be more likely to be scared out of it. Um, and so I would take these ideas, do your own research, and then forget how you found out about the idea. You have to build a commitment yourself. Uh, fair enough. Or you can invest in their funds, and then you'll know when to sell. Um, <laughs> either way, up to you. Uh, all right, so we'll do just kind of a question for each person on the panel. It'll be a slightly different question, um, and then we'll do audience questions. Um, Jessica, you have, uh, thank you for sponsoring. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what's uh, unique about the Willow Oaks offering from other service providers? Yeah, thank you. Um, clearly, uh, investors benefit when these guys are focused on their portfolio, when they're doing what they love and what they are good at. Um, so at Willow Oaks Fund Management Services, um, we look to do everything else for them. We uh, work with the, the traditional service providers, but we do all of the investor relations. We handle marketing um, and compliance um, and all of the operational infrastructure that help them scale. Um, and I, I cannot uh, overstate the importance of also events like this where we're building the community. Um, the community amongst these um, these fine peers, um, as well as you guys. So that's really what we do in a nutshell at FMF. All right, cool. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Bill next. Um, <coughs> uh, Bill put out one of, I thought, the greatest research pieces I, I'd read, at least at the time. I it sort of had to fight myself from buying it just when I, when I put it down. It was on uh, J.W. Mays. You should check it out. It, it I think it ages well. But uh, more recently, I think you did a big one. Well, you're on FRO, and then you're sort of teasing you might put out one. Can you talk a little bit about your your research process? Sure. So um, uh, the commonality between the three um, names is uh, they're all real estate names. And um, I, you know, I think it goes back to the, the industry expertise uh, competence. And we, we kind of have this, um, th this, this love affair with brick, mortar, and dirt. Uh, so it's half of what we do. Uh, I come from the background uh, on the engineering side, on the iBanking side. You know, I was in city from 06 to 09 uh, and saw 100 different ways that you could lose money in real estate. A lot of time involved, short-term leverage. And um, we kind of understood that uh, brochures could look wise, Google Maps could look wise, but there's nothing that beats putting boots on the ground, kick the tire. Um, you know, our investment process on the company called FRP Holding, uh, the company is, consists of a warehouse portfolio that they recently sold to Blackstone, a million square foot development on the river in Washington, D.C., and about fifteen, about 20,000 acres of aggregate um, you know, fields in Georgia and Florida. So I convinced my brother to drive with me down to D.C. for like a little weekend, you know, spend some time in D.C. and whatnot. We saw the warehouse. We saw the development site that had, they had on the river, and we said, this is pretty good asset. And I say... How would you like to drive down to Georgia and Florida, you know, like in a week? And he's like, eh, all right, whatever. So we got in his car, uh, you know, packed very light suitcases and drove all the way down to Flo Georgia and Florida, uh, put 3,000 miles in the car, saw about 70% of the assets. We drove through these aggregate fields and we we're paying attention to what kind of town they were in, um, what kind, you know, what kind of alternative use. When these, when they dig out the rock out from the ground, are they suitable for, uh, you know, 
multifamily development or are they just going to be some rock pit in the middle of nowhere? And what we were able to do from that process was that since, we, since I've seen every single asset, mentally I could kind of put value on what these um, assets are worth. And in late 2016, there was a period of uncertainty related to a presidential election where we backed the truck up. We thought it was an unlevered 50 cent dollar where, uh, you know, kind of going back to the really good, um, uh, you know, manager of a company, I would pick the ba uh, bakers on there. What they did is they basically told me that we do not view ourselves as being in the, you know, aggregate business, the real estate business. We consider ourselves being in the business of managing a pool of capital for our shareholders. And if there's a right price that it's offered, we will sell them. And, you know, when we dig into them, we realize that they sold a different company in the aggregate business to Vulcan Materials right before the housing bubble. They woke up one day and there was an offer on table. And uh, we, we had a lot of trust on, 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 on this management team. And in late 06, when, when there was some volatility before President Trump got elected, we backed the truck up and made it a 23% position in the fund at cost. And the way we justified was that I come from the private real estate business where people, you know, would make a, a, a piece of investment property 50% of the net worth. And I, I basically, on a look-through basis, uh, real kind of, I'm, I'm a real brick-mortar dirt junkie, right? And, and I say, we own 40 warehouses. We own a million developable square foot on Washington, D.C., which, you know, I was seeing, um, you know, the building going up. And we own 15 different sites. Like, how do we lose money? There's $40 million of debt on a six seven hundred million dollar asset base and it was cash flowing quite well and i you know there's a family that owns 20 percent. they they care they over the course of a year and a half they told me that they're shareholder, shareholder friendly and and that's kind of that's illustrative of our process of one getting to know the asset um you know real put put boots on the ground and then uh, getting to know the family behind it. A lot of times, you know, by the time we, we get to know the management team, we know their family tree, we know, you know, which cousin, which, you know, who, who likes to golf and who likes to uh, come into the office and work. Uh, that's, that's kind of representative of our process when we uh, invest in real estate companies. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's no time limit on this. I shouldn't say there's no time limit, but uh, <laughs> there's no time limit. Um, Steve, with Arquitos, uh, you're pretty concentrated, right? Uh, a 15% position is, is not like, uh, can you talk a little bit about why you run the fund that way? Well, yeah, j just just like Bill said, he built this 23% position up, but it depended on the balance sheet, right? So there was safety on the balance sheet uh, and whether the assets were showing, I mean, it might've been off balance sheet, but they're off balance sheet assets. Um, and so I, I think it has to fit your personality. Uh, my personality, is to, to dig deep into something. Uh, I don't want to be as distracted, so I'd rather uh, get to know something, a company very, very well, uh, and I'm willing to hold it through its transition. A lot of times you, you find the opportunity to buy in when it's in transition. That's when it's, uh, it's cheap on the balance sheet side. Uh, but I typically will have top five positions. will be 75% of the portfolio. I have a 22% position now, another 20% position, 15% position. And years ago, uh, 2013, at a company named ALJ uh, Regional Holdings that uh, had, uh, on the balance sheet, it was before they made the first acquisition, had these tax benefits. Uh, I had it at cost about 20% uh, of the portfolio. Uh, it tripled in value in the next uh, few years. And uh, the challenge is, how long can you continue to hold it? Well, it's still cheap on the balance sheet at 40% of the portfolio, but after it had doubled. Uh, so those are good problems to have, though. But it's difficult to, uh, to build up at cost uh, a position at that size if it's not based on balance sheet uh, characteristics. Uh, and and that's, that's where the safety comes in. Got it. All right, thanks. Um, I guess we'll go to Dan. Uh, <coughs> so Dan, um, we, we both own a company, Shide Vineyards. In fact, you were how I found it. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's an example of your fundamental due diligence and kind of what you did. I saw it firsthand, but you know these folks didn't. Sure, yeah, Shide, Shide was a fun one. So, so basically, he asked this question earlier, you know, what are the first things you look at 
this kind of fell into that situation. A, a friend of mine knew the guy that ran Shide, Al Shide, the patriarch, and they had done some investments together. And, and so we kind of said, hey, you know, you should look at my company, the Shide. Um, and so I, I, I had a pretty limited baseline when I first came to it. And <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a pink sheet company. They don't file 10Ks. Um, they just filed an, they just sent out an annual report if you were a shareholder and you requested it. So this was one where started with this annual report and you look down the balance sheet and you see, you know, vineyard land at cost. So, okay, well, that could be, you know, 20 year old land. We have to figure out what this is worth. And so this was one where I really, I, I really dug in um, and did some, some good fundamental research, starting with the Monterey County Assessor's Office database and the Monterey County Geographic Information Service mapping uh, resources, and was able to triangulate the two of these resources together, like going to the mapping s service, looking up anything with Shide or the different names of their vineyards from the, um, you know, from their, their uh, retail wine selling materials. You know, we own Riverview Vineyard. Okay, type in Riverview, get the parcel number, go over to the, the Monterey Assessor's Office, type in that, that parcel number, and just, just to prove out that they own it. And I kind of gave a teaser about this before. This was a situation where if you could just prove that they owned this 2,000 acres of land um, that weren't on the balance sheet, it was really, really cheap. Um, and so that was phase one, is just figure out what they own, where they own it, um, is there access to water or not. And then the second phase um, was talking to appraisers, starting to look at comparable transactions, just proving out, you know, what, are, what could they sell this land for tomorrow. And so that was phase one of the investment process. And this was one where it was a pretty short process for me, from hearing about the idea to proving all this out w and to starting to buy the stock was a, was a pretty short time period. And then subsequent to that, and at this point, I think the stock was about a 20 cent dollar on my math. Um, but based on liquidation value of the vineyard. And then the second phase of the process was to go out, meet with the company, spend a couple hours with, you know, CEO, CFO, COO, winemaker, operations, everything, tour the winery, tour the, the land, and get more comfort with the strategy. You know, what are you guys doing? How have you built this? It's, a, you know, been in the family for 40 plus years. How are you, you know, shepherding this value? Um, so there was an asset element and then an ongoing operational element. Um, but, but again, I, we talked about you know, time arbitrage, we talked about information arbitrage, we talked about small size. Um, th th I think this kind of fi fits into some of those ideas where um, you know, it's pretty far off the beaten path, not a lot of people do about it, um, and being able to do that work and prove it out uh, allowed us to buy it at a, what we thought was a pretty cheap price. I'd like to point out it also is a sin stock, so now you have <laughs> tobacco, <laughs> alcohol, ammunition. <laughs> did, you, did you drink the wine? Is it any good? <laughs> they claim that they make a $20 value bottle of wine that they then try to sell for 11 or $12. So they're providing value at a, a lower end price point of the market. <laughs> Wine's healthy last time I checked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, let's go to Keith, I guess. Uh, Keith, so it's pretty interesting. Your exposures to countries are, are probably un unlike anyone on this panel, right? You know, you'll have Korea, you know, in the teens or something, and it's, it's pretty... Well, it's 35. Yeah, so. okay, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? So can you talk about, like, how those exposures, like, interact with U.S. equities? Are they a hedge or, you know, how the portfolio works? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what they, they do, they do seem to follow, you know, it, it's going to be, the, the, the cycles are different in those countries, and, and one, of the, one of the key things we look at for countries that we, we feel comfortable going into is primarily what is the basis of their si their economic system, and do they have a long history of having you know what I would call is the the Anglo Dutch way of doing business and thinking about things. So it would include countries you know ac around the world that basically have been exposed to that that type of system, and in addition, countries where you see changes that's that's going towards that. Like Korea is a perfect example of where the government has set up a number of incentives for these family-run businesses to do the right thing. And, and both Korea and Japan are probably the places in the world where that's really happening. And, the, and where the advantage comes in is if you can identify companies that are sort of reacting to the government incentives in that way, then you, you, it, it, it provides some real interesting, because the, the valuations for Korea historically have been really low, and part of the issue has been corporate governance. But what we try to do is we try to find specific situations where the companies are actually sort of moving in that direction or that have sort of specific things that have actually gone on. So in Korea, there's, there's incentives for basically 
for families to basically set up these holding companies and as a result of setting up the holding companies they can pay the estate taxes and that allows them to basically sell portions of their businesses that are non-controlling interests so they can retain control but in return they have to get rid of cross holdings. I mean and there's other sorts of incentives they've sort of set up in, in both Korea and Japan is where I've seen around the world where these incentives are really moving and that's what's got me excited about those particular areas. But then the other areas around the world or other, other sort of areas, I, my investment experience starting out was in the United States, but then I've slowly been going overseas because I think from what I've seen, there seems to be some interesting opportunities there as a result of sort of uh, perceptions that, that as you see steps changing over time, the, va the money and the valuations will follow that. So. Great. Thank you. Um, let's kind of go down. Uh, Matt Sweeney. Um, there's, you like to buy cheap things, right? And there's this tension between buying something that's cheap and buying what's working, and how do you navigate? Uh, yeah, that's actually kind of been a problem I've been facing lately. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say right now that approximately 50% of my portfolio is trading below liquidation value, and I think value trap risk is very low because in every case there's a, a motivated, incentivized person that's working to close that gap to value. But those stocks haven't been moving lately, um, especially in context of you know, some of the SaaS stocks or you know anything that's trading at six times revenues can go to 10 times revenues overnight. And it's been frustrating to watch that, but I think what's important to keep in mind is kind of what we talked about earlier um, around structural advantages and time advantages. And I think everyone on this panel would agree that the indexes are not at all relevant to what we do. Um, so it's kind of keeping that in mind, and you could look back to Warren Buffett's famous article on the super investors of Graham and Doddsville and look at the people that he identified back in the early 80s as the best investors he knew and he lays out their track records and out of all the best investors he knew, every one of them trailed the S&P about one, in a, one out of every three years. And there's numerous studies since that time that kind of validate that with the best performing managers over longer periods of time. And I don't have anything against any of the SaaS stocks or any of the other things that have been working. They, they might work for other people and they might be the right investments for them but they're not for me. And I do feel pretty confident, though, that on a risk-adjusted basis, you're never going to run into trouble when you're buying things below liquidation value with someone that's working to close that gap. You might run into trouble if you're buying something that implies 20 years of success in front of the company. So right now, those stocks are working better, but the liquidation ones are timeless, and they're going to work at some point as long as you have that ability to stay with them and the structure to stay with them. So you're anti-SAS is what you're saying? <laughs> Not at all. It's a, it's an area I'd like to spend more time, um, but it's just not something no. that's as easy to look at, in my opinion. I hear you. All right, Rudy, uh, the accent. Um, <laughs> besides the accent, you talk a little bit about the differences between South Africa and the U.S. from an investing perspective. How, how many of you actually understand me? <laughs> <laughs> So the, qu the question was basically the difference between the U.S. and South Africa. Go you know, with his accent. So. Oh, his question? Yeah, I don't have no idea. <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> the differences. Um, I think if if you look at the continuum of market efficiency of global equity markets you will find that the U.S. equity market is way over on the very efficient side. And then on the other side of that spectrum, you will find South Africa towards the more inefficient side of the spectrum. And we are just finding many more attractive opportunities there. I mean, the South African investment market is not nearly as competitive as the U.S. investor market. Uh, the market is highly institutionalized. There is a very high degree of groupthink. And many few investors venture outside of the top 40 most liquid stocks on the stock exchange into the small and mid-cap space. So there are many opportunities within that spaces. Um, and I think independent thinking, just, can, just, can just you quantify many fewer investors? Um, well, I mean, I think you can though. I mean, that's why I, I no, I can. So 
maybe just to start with an interesting question. Uh, how many of you are South Africans in this room? Are there any South Africans in this room? Okay, we've got one. Ons moet na die tijd met ons adopt drank. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's no way that you would find 40,000 independent thinking uh, value investors descending on any event of any kind in South Africa. Uh, if you look at the setup of what we have there, um, my most recent information, we have about 25 registered hedge funds um, in South Africa. And only a few of those allocate a small portion of their um, portfolio to the small and mid-cap space. We have about 1,500 registered mutual funds there. Only 10 of them are concentrating on the small and mid-cap space. So it's a very, very uncompetitive uh, landscape that we're looking at. And then over and above that, the demographics are very real. Uh, take, for example, something like a Capitec bank. Where Capitec came in many years ago as a low-fee disruptor in the banking space. And since listing 2002, Capitec has delivered a KGAR of 52% per year over the past 17 years. Uh, or take another example, Kuro which does private schooling. Kuro, since listing 2009, has delivered a KGAR of 48%. And a Capitec bank and a Kuro private schooling has been done elsewhere in the world. It hasn't been done in South Africa. So that's why the South African demographics allows you that opportunity for investors to actually generate these types of returns. Um, so so I, I, I think kind of want to say that Maybe in many cases, the South African market currently is where the U.S. market could have been many, many, many years ago. And we are finding uh, many opportunities that are really, really attractive uh, in an inefficient market. But to summarize the difference, it's just much easier to have an edge in the South African market. Got it. All right. Thank you. Um, la last question before we go to kind of audience questions. Um, so, uh, let's see. Dave, um, prior to Alluvial, you had a, a blog, or I think you still have a blog, uh, OTC Adventures. Uh, can you talk about the process of like the sharing the ideas and how that served as a springboard to starting your fund? Sure. So I started writing on OTCAdventures.com in early 2012, and really the impetus behind that was I was really bored at my job <laughs> and had <laughs> a lot of free time, and at the time was just a single guy living in a little apartment uh, in Pittsburgh, knowing that I wanted to get into the value investing world somehow. I was working at a large, pretty conservative trust bank that really just hugged the index and was never going to do anything interesting investment-wise. And there it was in Pittsburgh, which is a great city, but definitely not a financial capital and not a lot of funds of any kind. And so I thought, well, if I ever want to work for a hedge fund or a private equity shop or anything like that, I, I probably should start making my own research and putting it out there somehow, and maybe somebody will notice. And sure enough, it didn't take long at all. I began writing about these intriguing over-the-counter companies I was finding. And uh, as uh, I can't remember who it was, but another panelist mentioned, uh, every time I wrote about a stock, emails poured in from someone else who would say, I love this company. I'm the largest shareholder. How did you ever find out about this? And we would strike up a conversation that way and it continue on from there. And after this had gone on for about a year or two, I started getting people saying, I like your thinking. Um, and not everything I wrote about did wonderfully, of course, but on, on the balance they did. And people would say, can you manage some capital for me? I have an IRA over here I don't touch, and I'd have to say I can't. Uh, I work for a large bank. Um, I can't compete against them, and the CFA Society would also not appreciate me doing something like that. But they'd say, well, if you ever go off on your own, uh, email me. I'll be your client. And so sure enough, toward the end of 2013, I decided it was a good time in my life to go ahead and and give it a shot. I said, I'll do this for two years. If I still can't draw a paycheck from Alluvial, I will polish up the resume and try to go back to work for someone else. And started with about three million under management in early 2014 and it snowballed from there. I kept writing online, dishing up interesting ideas on OTC adventures, not just US OTC stuff, but small cap and some international as well. And 
got more clients and my numbers were good and, and r it just uh, continued from there to the point where uh, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to partner with uh, Willow Oak in, in late 2016, early 2017. And as I said before, my life has changed a little bit since 2012. I'm now the father of two young kids and a homeowner, and I just don't have much time to ride on OTC adventures anymore. But I try to pop up now and then with something fun. So you guys should it. check it out. Um, so I think we're going to move to audience questions in a second. If you're in the back and want to sit down, there's some some seats. I don't know if you want to feel free to uh, you know kind of fill them in. Um, but the first audience question looks like a notebook of some sort. It's, it's, it's you're going to like it. Anyway, does anyone ha would anyone like to go first? <laughs> do they need, do they need microphones or we'll just repeat the question? We'll just repeat the question. Uh, question was mistakes, and that's that's the, you know I, I, honestly I think people on the stage here really like that question. I really like that question because that gives us an opportunity to be self-critical, uh, and the mistakes that I've generally made are when there's too much leverage, uh, or when when the underlying you know, the company when the operations relied on some something that had kind of variables beyond the control of the company, so, so like such as a commodity or something like that. Um, couple that with cyclicality and leverage, and, and that's, uh, that's what I've, I've gotten in trouble uh, with, attempt to learn from, but it's, it's an ongoing process. You know, we're, we are gonna continue to make mistakes, but uh, uh, you, know, you just have to, have to learn from them, but also not overcorrect. I could say quickly that uh, earlier in my career, I started buying things that were, quote, really cheap without realizing they were cheap for a reason. And I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make, especially when starting out, because if you start reading the doctrine of value investing, you probably start with Ben Graham, who was really working on statistical methods. And he was working at a time where that stuff was much more effective because there was nobody finding all that stuff all the time. In today's world, where computers are going through every filing, every second, every day, I think anything that looks statistically cheap is somewhat suspicious, because if it looks, suspicious, uh, it looks statistically cheap, then all the computers have already gone through it. And if it's still cheap, that means it's got to be somebody selling it, and that's probably the fundamental people. So anytime I see something that's statistically cheap, my suspicion level goes way up. And it took me a long time to figure that out. Now, in my defense, Warren Buffett has also said it took him a long time to figure that out, so I don't feel so bad. Yeah, I, I think for me it's the same thing that Steve's sort of the leverage issue. When I was a, doing, doing this stuff as a private investor, I basically bought a, a decent business, a cable business in the UK that was over levered. And at the time I didn't realize it. I continued to invest and it went down, eventually went to zero and then I bought it when it came out of bankruptcy and it was, a, it actually turned out to be a good investment. And what that, th what that did to my investment process is that now for every company that I look at, I do a, a credit analysis on the business. And another thing that's really available now, which is sort of interesting is for most, for pretty much all my businesses, I look at what the debt's doing because the debt is another sort of indication of whether there may be a, and what the debt yield really is compared to let's say the free cash flow yield on a particular company. And if the spread is relatively wide, the real question is who's right? Is it the debt market or is it the equity market? And in, in my experience, the debt market for the most part is a lot more reliable. If the, well, their, their equation is a lot simpler. All the debt market people are worried about is making their money back. And so the equation is can I make my money back and what's the probability of that? And then I'm gonna put that in terms of f coming up with a value for the debt. The equity is much more difficult because you not only have to worry about the possibility of loss, but you have the possibility of gain. So one thing I've learned through that process is actually using the debt markets and sometimes if the, if the security is liquid enough, look using the options market to take a look at what are these other markets telling you about the specific security. And so that's something that's over time, it sort of helped the, the, pro the process, at least that I go through in terms of some of these more leveraged businesses, which can be interesting, but you have to be aware of sort of the leverage issue in terms of it blowing you up. I've gotten into trouble before investing in a company where the leadership clearly was not interested in making decisions on a basis of what generates the most, the highest increase in value on a per share basis. Uh, I invested in a company, a natural resources company, not long after they went through bankruptcy, where 
everything seemed incredibly cheap, lots of cash flow, good assets, but then leadership decided that they wanted to be the CEOs and leaders of a much larger natural resources company, and so they went about uh, recombining with their hived off bad assets they shed in the bankruptcy and set about becoming a top five producer rather than a top ten. Uh, and they just, they wanted the glory and the glamour of being hotshot CEOs and didn't really care much about what the share price did. And looking back, I should have realized that because this was the same CEO and team that led the company into bankruptcy in the first place. And there was little indication that anything had changed. So uh, I now spend a lot more time looking at the track record and the motivations of the people I'm investing in because I found that in small companies especially, they can be extremely personality driven. There's not much institutional <coughs> culture sometimes at these companies in the way there might be at a large cap or multinational company. And the leadership and the direction and the inspiration that's coming from the top is absolutely critical and in the direction of the company. A number of us got a chance to spend some time with Annie Duke uh, last fall, who's a professional poker player. And we talked a lot about our process and, and understanding um, outcomes as uh, and, and judging outcomes um, as based on being right or, or based on luck. Because in this business, you can have things that you make money on that are actually mistakes and, and vice versa. You kind of can hit all four quadrants. And so you, you guys have probably all heard Buffett and Munger talk about, you know, no called strikes in this business. You, you don't have to, you, you should be fine about missing things that work, right? And I'm fine about missing lots and lots of things. Um, but one thing that came out of that conversation with Duke, which kind of caused me a little, a little bit more introspection, is, is trying to think about the things that are in the circle of competence that, you, that I do the work on and that maybe I go as far as buying a starter position and I actually commit some capital and then never take it beyond that, and they wind up really, really working. So there's this kind of errors of omission element. I'm fine with errors of omission on all sorts of, you know, Bitcoin and different things, but there should be errors of omission that we're more upset about, um, and trying to quantify those and, av and avoid those. Um, so that's it's something that I've been spending some time thinking about. I think you know mo most of the mistakes that uh, we made over time, and 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 we thought a lot about improving the process is um, business qualities. I think there's um, you know a bunch of panelists have mentioned about uh, business quality in the past about uh, screening for a low PE, low price to free cash flow, and I think over time we learn that um, that you know the world's kind of changed. Computer screens can kind of find these uh, stocks fairly easily. And I think you know the uh, a lot of the mistakes are are made where, where we say, oh, you know, it's it's five times pre cash flow, and uh, but you know if there are structural elements or there are elements that where it makes the the existing company very difficult to turn around the operation. So a perfect example would be years ago we uh, went into Macy's. So Macy's is a rare mistake in real estate investing. Uh, I think you know. Um, I think internal stats are, are, we're batting average pretty high in real estate, but Macy's is one of those rare, and, and we kind of view it as a real estate investment rather than retail investment, where we looked at the whole block that they own in Harrow Square, what they own in San Francisco, and kind of like, uh, you know, one of my interns here did the top 100 malls that they own locations in. We looked at the Yelp reviews, you know, do they have a Tesla in there? Do they have an Apple store in there? You know, what, what is the sales per square foot? And, and, and we, you know, did a fairly deep dive on Macy's real estate. Uh, we were smart enough to realize that, you know, Sears is just a big bag of flaming dog poo, right? So we like, <laughs> we like, didn't, didn't put our brain damage there, but we thought Macy's was a better retail operator. And our, our view was that uh, women and men will still go to the store because they want to try on the clothing. And we way underestimated the transformation. And, and the, other, the other element is that when sales drop, you know, 5%, that meant your EBITDA got cut in half. There, there were all these elements of how mediocre a department store operation is. And um, we, you know, we, we kind of looked at the real estate and said, that is the downside protection. Now, there was a critical piece of that analysis. Let's hypothetically say that Macy's was a real estate company. The one of the questions that we, you know, one of the aspects that we overlooked was that 
as a real estate landlord, you would never underwrite a portfolio where it had one single tenant. And, and that was something that we overlook and, and, and we, we thought a lot about that. You know, if we want to own, say, you know, X billion dollars of real estate, we will want at least, you know, 10 different tenants to be able to, um, uh, because, cause, you know, if Macy's, the operator goes down, it, you know, the real estate value goes down with it. The, the other problem is, you know, big ships don't turn around. They're not tugboats. These are big oil tankers, and you're trying to maneuver in, 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 in a small, you know, harbor. And, and I think we, we, we think a lot about that, and our kind of new slogan investing is kind of uh, quarries, rock pits, hard asset, real estate on one end, and then on the other end is, is you know, defensible, large mode, um, you know, network effect companies that where you could re readily see the structural advantage, uh, kind of like, you know, what Keith said about the Ash T business model. And we're trying to uh, eliminate a lot of these kind of very medi mediocre businesses in the middle that will get disrupted over time. So I think those are the two barbell approach in terms of where we focus on and quality. I think, I think you know, the, um, the, the five time free cash flow, mediocre, the, the, the restaurants that owns a lot of real estate, the Sears, the Macy's, like, you know, the, over time, like, w I think we, we, we like to, um, uh, you know, to, to stop uh, looking in that pile. So you haven't thought about that topic at all? <laughs> that was an unbelievable answer, by the way, I thought. Um, anyone else want to, you know, air dirty laundry, or should we go to another question? What's the last question? Uh, next question. <laughs> Anyone? In the back? Well, yeah, I, I can answer at least from the perspective of, I mean, we control a public company. You know, we own almost 30% of, of Enterprise Diversified. Uh, it's a quasi-permanent holding. Um, and... Uh, so I, th I think other than that, we've had some positions in the 5% area, but I think unless you, you really have uh, something unique about it, whether it's uh, a couple board seats or something like that, uh, you know, once you start getting up into those very large positions, we're not really activists, uh, but you know, if you want to be a long-term owner on it, you have to have some sort of, some sort of uh, uh, representative there. Anyone else own 30% of a com company? <laughs> you know, I, I, I could chime in on that. And, and the question is on, like, uh, how much of a company will we own, right? Uh, I, I think the, the way to kind of think about that is, is one, um, you know, you kind of go through the normal metric of, like, what's it trading as a discount, right? What's it growing? I mean, we look at a lot at we, – we like getting into weird, quirky, orphan securities, but – in our mind, we kind of always have a, um, uh, a a three to five year time horizon of there's there's some sort of transformation going on at a company level where where there will be a shareholder base for this company sometime down the road. So so you know we're small, we're nimble. You know we we can own a lot of company, but if we believe that there's a deep discount, the 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 value is increasing over time. And that there's a very trustworthy management team in place. We're willing, you know, we're, we're willing. Uh, I mean, we're small fund, but you know, we're we're not afraid to, uh, you know, to go up and own a good chunk of the company. Um, so that's a short answer. I think that's a really good question for Scott. <laughs> Why don't you? Yeah, the, que the question was, if I, I'll paraphrase that, uh, we're relatively small funds, emerging funds. As we get larger, uh, we if there's been a focus on small companies. Uh, how do you know if if the fund is too big to still take advantage of some of those opportunities? Is that fair? Yeah, that's Scott is the largest fund, I believe, on the panel. So this is why the question goes to him. Um, so the way I, I think about fund size is 
in part the opportunities that you're pursuing, right? And so for me, I, I've found that um, in the kind of sub $50 million uh, dollar or even sub $100 million, I'll let you know Dave and some others play there. I haven't had as much success there. And so if you told me, you know, if I had to give up concentration or the ability to go nano nano cap, despite you know the kind of slide I did, I would give up the the really small end of the market. And so um, for me, it's about can I kind of have a position size I'm comfortable in liquidity, um, and I want to be able to invest in the kind of the two hundred million dollar uh, market cap company, and I want to have it be about a seven percent position. And so you know that's that's the way I think about it. The other way I think about it is my capital base. So we have a lot of money that's locked up for three years. We have, you know, have been very fortunate in terms of redemptions. And then um, my family capital and, and the Royce family, uh, you know, represent a good chunk of capital. And so the really illiquid stuff, I mean, so we own 10% of a really small company. We have to be willing to own that when everyone else leaves. And I can't have, you know, I can't be way out there and, you know, have 60% of the funds and super illiquid. The super illiquid kind of get big is like, you know, me and Mr. Royce, will we may be the last owners of it, and that's okay. Um, you know, if you guys all leave, that'll be your loss because, you know, we think they're going to do great. But so that's, I mean, there, there are kind of some puts and takes there. I wouldn't say it's uh, there's a specific, like, formula for it, but I think about kind of can I still invest in the companies I want to invest in, the size I want to invest with concentration, and, like, I want to make sure my liquidity – of the portfolio matches my, not only matches my investor base, but you know I'm I'm not even going anywhere near, kind of where I could have redemptions and have forced sellings. I'll just hold it. So. I'll kind of jump in on that a little bit. It's interesting. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has had this experience, but I've had capital allocators come to me and say they love what I'm doing. They've been following me for a long time. They're happy with my process. They love to invest with me. Let me know when you get to 100 million under management. <laughs> and I'm very honest. I don't know if my strategy is going to work at 100 million dollars. I'm, I'm honest. A lot of my success has come in companies that are 100 million, 250 million dollar market cap. And maybe it'll work. Depends on the you know, environment at the time. I mean, if it's 2009, I can manage 100 million dollars. I can manage a lot more as than anyone in this room actually. But I think it's important to also keep in mind that the quality of your LP base is a two-way street. And I think everyone up here is very thoughtful about the LPs they accept. And nobody here wants hot money. Nobody here has monthly liquidity. Almost all of my money is three-year or five-year commitment period. And that's a commitment for my LPs that they're have, they want to give me that runway. And I want to make the same commitment to them and say, well, you're buying into a strategy that's been based on these small company successes. So I'm not going to take it and try and make it a billion dollar strategy because it will just be lying to me and lying to you. So you just have to be aware of where the successes come from. And you know, the, I think one of the things that all of us have as small managers, none of us ever need to scale. Because when you're a one man shop, you can make a lot of money with $100 million under management. And if you start having a team of analysts and you start having an investment committee and everything else, you start having a fancy office, all of a sudden you need a couple billion dollars just to keep the lights on. And then your returns are out the window. But I don't think anybody here aspires to that. I think everybody here just aspires to focus on returns and, and really enjoys and, and loves what they're doing. Yeah, I think we have a question. I'll just repeat that. That was the views on holding cash versus being fully invested. Well, I mean, I'll go ahead and start out. I, 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 my philosophy is it really depends upon your your investor base, but the way I look at it is if someone wants to hold cash, they can hold cash in their own account, and they're paying me basically to manage manage the money. So my portfolio is pretty much 90 to 100% invested at all times. I don't know how to time the markets. I don't even try to pretend that I do. So basically, you know, and it, but again, it so really depends on your investor. Some people have investors that want to have sort of that aspect of it, but I think it really depends upon the investor base and what and and it may vary depending upon the you know who the investors are yeah from my perspective i mean i invest according to the opportunity cost so the cash si cash sizing will depend on what the opportunity cost and what the market dictates but i do think that cash is the option of which the premium is under uh, appreciated especially in very volatile markets so if the market and the opportunity cost 
uh, warrants it, then I'll be happy to go down to a 0% cash, po cash position. But if I know that uh, that cash is going to give me an option, uh, I will sit on 10 or 20% cash. I like that we're getting some uh, slightly uh, slightly varying viewpoints up here because there are a number of thoughts of people have about holding cash versus not holding cash. Personally, the, the partners who have come to Alluvial uh, have always, and I've agreed, have always ex expressed the thought that I'm paying you to invest in good ideas. If you don't have good ideas, well, I probably know another manager who does. And so I should not hold onto cash that I honestly cannot find a good place for. Now, sometimes it'll be me with the good ideas and other managers without, and it may be the opposite at other times. And so I don't get upset if another manager says, hey, Dave, I was thinking about giving you some money, but this other manager over here is doing really interesting stuff in this particular market. Uh, good for them. My turn will come. I would just add that I, I love to hold cash, uh, but I've been fully invested for, I don't know, two and a half years now, three years maybe. And I don't, I'll don't. i call it a problem, but it's a good problem to have, is every time I have some cash, I'll find something that's just ridiculously cheap. And you look at it and say, the option value of cash is, is very important, as Rudy said, and I love to have that. But if you're finding things that are cash flowing and trading below liquidation value with a CEO out there trying to change a story and the market is missing a big piece of the puzzle, your downside is theoretically limited. Now, we all know that when liquidity dries up and markets go south, th those theories go out the window and they might go down a little bit, so you have to keep that in mind. But that's market timing if you're gonna say, I'm not gonna invest in this thing that's ridiculously cheap because I wanna hold some cash. So it's you know, very much the opportunity set. I uh, Actually, I would love to tackle this problem. Uh, question, well. Uh, so since our founding, we have held on average 35% cash, so probably very different than everybody else on this panel. And uh, you know, a lot of it stems from, uh, I was a sell side real estate analyst at Citigroup. I went there in late 06, and then uh, where real estate was a very liquid asset class, and I took a lot of phone calls from people, real estate developers who say, get like I need an equity injection or I'm gonna go broke. And I lived through that experience and also I was there the day when City hit one dollar from fifty dollars. So there's some memories from that time period when liquidity dries up, volatility, you know, VIX hits eight, eighty you know, eighty. And um, we so speaking about self aware, I mean this is like a little a little therapeutic, right? Being self aware, I think when we started out, we realized that I'm a year one manager, and um, it it you know I don't have the skill set of a five year manager or a ten year manager, and we held a lot of cash in the beginning, and um, what well, over time you know we become a little bit more confident as a manager, a little bit you know we think we become a little bit better as a manager who could identify uh, better opportunities, uh, but we've held thirty five percent cash, and what we what we found over time is one, you know, it's great optionality than volatile times, but it is an anchor that holds back your performance. I mean, anyone who held 35% cash in the last five, six years is is gonna look, you know, uh, you, you know, like uh, compared to what the S&P does, like you, you, gonna, you may have some second thought on that decision. But we, uh, you know, we, we're big believers in holding dry powder. What we have been able to evolve and be able to kind of um, change our strategy a little bit, we think about it from the perspective of having dry powder when, when, when the, the world's full of fear. So how do we achieve that, right? It, it's to us holding cash and creating that dry powder, creating that windfall of cash when the market is very volatile is not about, you know, kind of like getting volatility out of your performance. What it is is it's inversely creating dry powder when everything goes on sale, right? You know, we we, we own stuff in portfolio today that we think are very, very cheap, right? But the public market could, could drive things to even cheaper. So we never want to be in a position where if we own something that's a 50 cent dollar and goes to 30 cent dollar, we have no dry powder to buy anymore. So a good illustrative example of this is we, you know, our largest position in Howard Hughes was a 12% position, but I understand that 
It's a misunderstood company. It's a, it's a $5 billion market cap company. But you could also go out, when it traded at $140 last year, you go out and buy $115 puts that had a seven-month duration on it for $1.66. And, and we, you know, being in a public market, you're seeing that the, 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 it doesn't pay dividends, so the market kind of just, just will, it will just trade whatever the market will take it to. And, and we thought that uh, that $1.66 put was fairly cheap. We went out, bought those, and Howard Hughes subsequently went from $140 down to $90. But at $90, those puts were, you know, we sold one lot for $25. But that, when that windfall came out, that was also the time we could back the truck up and buy Howard Hughes at an average of $96 a share. So we kind of viewed the hedging strategy as a way to generate dry powder cash and, and, and a windfall at exactly the right time that there is bargains in the market. So I think, you know, if we kind of think about our, our philosophy of holding cash, I think in the long run, 35% is probably too high of a number. I think that number will go down, but as we move up the quality scale, as we move up market cap, as we you know start holding companies that that are mo larger, more liquid, and that has options that trade where we could hedge, you know, we 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 have positions where we think the companies will compound at 25% a year for a three to five year period. Yet you could go out and buy puts that are 15% out of the money, and will cost you about three four percent to hedge that. And 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 I think that's a great way. You know, going back to what I said earlier about being able to sleep well at night, right? Being able to have the dry powder to buy more. We, we like to hedge it in, in the perspective of, of, of not, to, not to like, you know, mute the volatility in the performance, but to have the dry powder when it is, it is absolutely the cheapest back the truck up time. So I see it totally differently. <laughs> No, I'll, I'll just talk about it one second just because uh, I have opinions on this too. I guess we all do. Um, I think one of the benefits of being a small manager is you have a lot of flexibility, right? And so, um, and, and I'm pretty conservative. I can't find something that I think is going to outperform cash over a medium period of time. Like, I, I have a 6% hurdle rate. So, first of all, I should just like go home, right? I, I hopefully, given kind of the pattern recognition and the, the related networks and how hard I work, hopefully I can find something that outperforms cash. Um, and then, but then I have to think about like the liquidity of my portfolio, right? And so, I have a bunch of positions where I can be out of them in a minute, <laughs> you know, a day at the most, like, like literally an hour. And so I can I can be thirty percent cash, like you know, any any time I want. And so I, I think to me, it's it's the expected value of what I'm doing is hopefully very positive. And so I want to be generally fully invested, um, but I having enough liquidity that I can you know change my mind. And I think that's the beauty of being small. So, so could, if uh, I could add it to that a little yeah, bit, yeah. okay. Uh, w I'm I'm a um, I guess like a diehard in studying how people fail, and or firms fail, companies fail, and before I launched a fund, I, I studied a lot of why a lot of you know funds went out of business, and I interviewed a lot of other managers, and what I you know some of the feedback was some of the managers said that owning Berkshire and Fairfax in their portfolio was what allowed them to kind of generate the dry powder in the 08-09s, uh, you know, in, in the last big drawdown. You know, Fairfax had the puts that paid out, you know, Berkshire was large and liquid, and that was what, that was a source of liquidity for them that allowed them to redeploy that capital to find, you know, the net net that was trading at three times P and tendering for stock. So we spent a lot of time studying history and studying, it, I, I'm, I'm very creative when it comes to thinking about how we could fail, how Rhizome could fail, and we never want to be there. So going to, you know, stop, uh, Scott's, uh, you know, if you own a mix of small, illiquid, but there's also a certain allocation to larger, more liquid, pair with puts, uh, that's that's a situation where we could feel really comfortable at night. And uh, I, I'm just a little surprised because, like, you know, I, I talk to people about using push strategies, and people look at me like I got a banana slug, like, coming out of my brain, right? But, like... <laughs> It's not that hard, guy. Just pull up the option chain. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. I think we do one more question all the way in the back. It's been patiently.
I'll just repeat that commonalities that we've all seen amongst our investors that are willing to invest with people like us and then also take on a lockup. And I would say for me personally, and I know this is true for some of the other guys too, almost every single one of my investors falls into a select like one or two groups. One group is people that actually used to run funds just like mine, except now they have too much money. So they can't invest in the same way that I am, the same companies I am, so they give it to me. But they clearly understand what I'm doing. They understand the volatility um, that can come with a concentrated strategy and investing in things that are off the beaten path. So they're very comfortable with it. And then the other group is, I should say actually there's three groups. The other group is people that were entrepreneurs and built businesses and sold businesses and have a very clear understanding of the difference between market value and business value because they've lived through it themselves. And then the third group would be kind of like you know, do it, do it yourself home gamers where they would love to be doing this professionally, but they have another job, but their hobby is actually coming to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, for example, and they spend a lot of their time thinking the same way that we're all thinking and that Warren Buffett has told us is one of the better ways to think about investing. So everybody's completely fluent in what we're trying to do, and that's a group that just self-selects. To your point, 95% of the people look at it and immediately say it's, it's not for them. It's probably higher than 95%. But that's true about concentrated in investing in general, even without a lockup. I mean, most people, Scott started out with what percentage of funds actually take large size positions. It's less than 1%. So most people just don't get it. But those people that do get it, they get it all the way to their core. And they know what we're doing and they understand it and they're signed up for the ride. Yeah, I, th I think it's very clear that all of us, we're just who we are. And we try to let the world know who we are through posting our letters or you know doing various things. Um, and then people self-select for us. To a very large extent, I mean, we, we're sitting with unique opportunity sets um, that we can extract outside uh, outsized performance from. But it's very important to have the right quality of capital, not just the right quantity of capital. So although you're writing your selection, that self-selection that every one of them has been referring to is actually ideal because we want to partner with someone who's like-minded and someone who's also got the temperament, uh, someone who understands uh, the opportunity that volatility brings um, instead of being uh, frightened by volatility. I think it's a uh, happy hour. <laughs> uh, thank you guys, all the panelists. Um, you I, I, I would... I would just say, I hope it came through. These guys are craftsmen, right? They're, they really care about what they do. They're really thoughtful about their portfolio. And we truncated a bunch of their answers tonight, but like, I would try and get on their distribution lists. I would talk to them. They, they are, they're good. <laughs>